I grew up like uh, I started reading books outside of Islam, critical of Islamic theology and crit and books of science, Stephen Hawking's, Richard Dawkins, you know, all the books that kind of like lead people out of religion. And I remember when I read them, I was so angry. Well, I had that moment of revelation throughout that time where I'm like, oh, my God, all my life has been a lie. But after that, I started identifying as anti-theist, not even like um, uh, atheist. But I, I believe that, that the religion in itself is evil. And I remember during that time, I don't, I don't adhere to that anymore. I'll, I'll get into that uh, in a bit. But I remember when I was an anti-theist, um, I only had around four or six months of being an anti-theist till I left Yemen. And that moment when I was an anti-theist for four to six months before leaving Yemen was highly traumatic because I would talk to people and start asking questions about religion and God, and they would give me the most ridiculous questions. And I remember feeling like, oh my God, I'm stuck in an asylum house full of people who believe in the most ridiculous hadiths and 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 books, and there's no way out of it. And so, so, so I remember before that, when I was a Muslim, I always had the cognitive dissonance of, wait, I am a Muslim, but I don't believe in the Islam that the rest of the Muslims believe in. My Islam is very pacifistic. It's very open-minded. It does not believe in killing and all of that. So. That was my version of Islam. But then there's also the, the Islamic version of Islam, which is in the schools and the mosques. So where the scholars and imams say, no, 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 that's not Islam. The real Islam is yada, yada, yada. So there was always this plethora of what is Islam? What is a Muslim? Am I a real Muslim? That, that happened to me throughout my life in Yemen. Hi everyone, welcome to the Untethered Mind, where we delve into fascinating and often challenging worlds of mental health, social issues, and personal journeys. In this special segment, we will explore the complex and often hidden realm of religious trauma, but not just limited to talking to therapists, social workers, and activists. We'll also be talking to a lot of ex Muslims as well who have been inflicted by a extreme religion, specifically Islam for ex-Muslims. Uh, but we'll talk to social media influencers, content creators who are raising awareness about religious trauma and also sharing the stories of ex-Muslims. Um, today with us, we have somebody that you probably already know, but we're going to talk about very different things. We're going to talk to Luai today. Luai Ahmed, Swedish Yemeni journalist, influencer, content creator, Zionist, uh, provocateur, yeah, agent, spy, a lot of different names that people have given you over time. Oh, sad, that's uh, very recent. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but Luai and I first met in Sweden pre his influencer world when he was a columnist. And we met as, you know, our common background, which was uh, being paid by Zionists before we even knew you know, yep. how we could be paid. Um, but we, we met as ex-Muslims and we naturally vibed and we're really close friends outside of it. So we'll try to be as objective as we can. Um, try. Try, exactly. So when I met Luai, um, he was working and writing a column for a Swedish newspaper bulletin, which a lot of Swedes consider conservative. But Luai, in my opinion, and myself, you know, we were bringing the liberalism to it by our previous podcast, Blasphemy. Um, and a lot of Luai's commentary was kind of involving bringing the realization to many Swedish people about the Islamism. I mean, Islamism, racism, politics, and, you know, now you've gone a bit more wider and, you know, talking about, um, you know, in English to get a large audience to share your story, but also to advocate and bring other people's stories alive from across seas. So why? Tell us more about yourself, pre what people knew you from social media. So born in Yemen, moved to Sweden. Tell us a bit more about the born in Yemen and growing up part. It's fascinating. I think I've told you 
a long time ago, but I'm not sure if you remember that <clears throat> when I first moved to Sweden, I had a Facebook account in Arabic, Loi Ahmad. Mm -hmm. And in my Facebook account, I used to write and post stuff in Arabic, mostly directed at Yemenis. And I had like a respectable amount of following, maybe like 12, 15,000 Yemenis who followed me on the page. And I only wrote in Arabic. And that page is now deactivated. However, when I go back to 2014, 15, 16, especially 14 and 15, my first two years in Sweden, I was what you would call an anti-theist, where I was very avidly against religion, period. Uh, I did not believe that religion should be part of human life ever. Um, and that's when we talk about religious trauma, that was my, my religious trauma because it's in 2013 and 2014 where I started reading philosophical and scientific books that made me realize, wait, the world is much bigger than Islam. Islam is just this tiny little thing. And during that period, the following years, I was very angry. I was very angry because I felt like the Islamic world in my community gate kept the truth, gate kept evolution, gate kept um Big Bang, human rights, all of these things. So I was very angry and my Arabic posts were very angry. Like I used to write things like, um, hey, Yemenis, if you want our society, our society to develop, maybe you should stop killing our women, question mark. And I used to write all of that in Arabic and it used to have a lot of angry reactions. The vast majority of the commentators would be calling me a youth. I have no honor. I should be killed. That, that was in Arabic. And I think it was around 2017, 18, around three, four years after I, I was in Sweden where I felt like, oh, now I can speak proper Swedish and I can actually engage and start writing articles. And then I started like doing my work in Swedish in 2019. And then in twenty third and in Swedish, I wrote mostly about Islamism, about migration, because you cannot you cannot discuss Islamism in Sweden without discussing migration, because migration is what led to the birth or rebirth of uh, of Islamism in in Sweden and other parts in the West. So in Swedish, I used to write a lot about these things, integration, how was, I was able to learn Swedish. I wrote even, I think, in my three years uh, as a columnist in Bulletin in Sweden, I wrote three or four articles specifically about anti-Semitism. Uh, and then October 7th happened. One month before October 7th happened, I had already bought my studio. Like I uh, fixed the studio in my apartment, the camera, lights, and I knew I'm, I'm going to start making videos in English. And then one month after I, I decided that October 7th happened. And that kind of like flipped my world upside down. We would need like six hours in order to explain what happened to me on October 7th. But since then, I've been making content in English, mostly videos and posts sometimes, and I write and stuff. But ever since October 7th, it has been more about anti-Semitism in Israel. Before that, it was more about migration and is Islamic extremism and, and the infiltration of Islamism in uh, Swedish institutions and Western institutions. And before that, it was me directly talking to the Yemenis, t telling them, what are we doing? And like, I, when I see my posts, for, my Yemeni posts, all of them had the, the, the tone of, hey, Yemenis, why are we doing this? Let's do this instead. Why are we, like, I was talking like I was talking to my best friend in a very, like, upset, let's do better kind of manner. So th those are, like, the three phases. In Arabic in the beginning, and then in Swedish in like from 2018 to 23. And that's when I decided English now. And who knows, maybe in the coming years, it will be Hebrew. Uh, you're learning Hebrew? No, I'm not. I'm not. But I, I, I would want to. If I, if I ever end up moving to Israel, which is possible because I genuinely love Israel so much as a country for getting the politics, um, I might. Like Hebrew is a very fascinating language. It's very similar to Arabic. It would take me much less time to pick up than any other language because it's so similar to Arabic. So I wouldn't rule it out. But no, I, I think just, I'm going to stick to English. I, I just want to clarify to our viewers, Loa is not moving to Israel. There's no way he's going further <laughs> away from me. So that is not going to happen. And if there are other Israelis watching, he's mine. 
<laughs> anyway, so basically what you've described is over the past X amount of years, you've been, I guess, always a dissenter, right? But you also come from a family, like your, your mum was an activist, your mum was outspoken, and you talk about your dad's assassination when you were quite young. So you came from a very, a family who has been empowering you in many ways, uh, you know, outside your current um you outside your current content but it has empowered you or given you the strength to actually challenge the norms as well i want i want you to take us to what it was like when your luai was in yemen before he discovered he was gay before you know he discovered about you know the world that could exist of not being a muslim i know the ex-muslim term for many of us is quite new so i want you to take us back to like you know what was it like growing up with your parents as much as you can remember with i guess about your dad and then also you know your mom being a very prominent feminist activist and you know i guess she kind of set the standard and at least at least from what i hear about her she's amazing and you know set the standard of going like you know we need to fight this even if you have your disagreements but you know she she was a she is a dissenter herself as well so tell us more about like growing up in Yemen. So uh, it's weird because every time I look back at that period of my life, um, I don't ever remember feeling like I belonged. Neither like as a sexual orientation, I didn't fit in because everybody felt or was heterosexual around me. There was no visibility of my identity, my sexual identity. So I grow, I grew up kind of like, pushing back my, my sexual identity as a perversion. So it's kind of like maybe growing up as a pedophile, knowing you're a pedophile, you're attracted to children, but you hide it and not say anything about it. That's how I treated my homosexuality. I'm going to, I'm going to just like add a commentary there that, you know, for a lot of Muslims that compare pedophilia to being gay, this is not the right example. <laughs> but 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 it but 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 uh, but it is the the fear of uh, living as as a person who is um it is who is gay um it is it is that you know that that repression um not just living gay but also living as an atheist in the closet the repression is um very right. it's very much the norm but sorry continue so you so you lived in I guess, repressing yourself, your yeah. sexuality, but also who you are, maybe not just your sexuality. Right. Uh, so, so I grew up like uh, I started reading books outside of Islam, critical of Islamic theology and crit and books of science, Stephen Hawking's, Richard Dawkins, you know, all the books that kind of like lead people out of religion. And I remember when I read them, I was so angry. Well, I had that moment of revelation throughout that time where I'm like, oh my God, all my life has been a lie. But after that, I started identifying as anti-theist, not even like um, uh, atheist, but I, I believe that, that the religion in itself is evil. And I remember during that time, I don't, I don't adhere to that anymore. I'll, I'll get into that uh, in a bit. But I remember when I was an anti-theist, um, I only had around four or six months of being an anti-theist till I left Yemen. And that moment when I was an anti-theist for four to six months before leaving Yemen was highly traumatic because I would talk to people and start asking questions about religion and God, and they would give me the most ridiculous questions. And I remember feeling like, oh my God, I'm stuck in an asylum house full of people who believe in the most ridiculous hadiths and, and, and books, and there's no way out of it. And so, so, so I remember before that, when I was a Muslim, I always had the cognitive dissonance of, wait, I am a Muslim, but I don't believe in the Islam that the rest of the Muslims believe in. My Islam is very pacifistic. It's very open-minded. It does not believe in killing and all of that. So that was my version of Islam. But then there's also the, the Islamic version of Islam, which is in the schools and the mosques. So where the scholars and imams say, no, 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 that's not Islam. The real Islam is yada, yada, yada. So there was always this plethora of what is Islam? What is a Muslim? Am I a real Muslim? That that happened to me throughout my life in Yemen. And when I think I it was 
sorry to interrupt I'm like I was gonna say I feel like when you're talking it was like the same for me as well I had created a version of Islam that worked for me you know the the version that was empathetic but still like would pray maybe or would think that praying five times a day is a commitment to um a god even if I you know was not very attached to the idea of god right right um and 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 then when you know you come across like you know I think for me it was more traumatic leaving Islam and coming across that you know the apostasy law where I was like I didn't grow up with that I didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't even thinking about that and that only further embedded the idea for me mm. so what was it I, I I guess sorry I interrupted you but but that was just something that I was thinking that like you know when you said you created this version it was almost like coddling ourselves and I'm like you know maybe we're mm. still Muslims we like the identity it's okay right I think that traumatic moment that you talked about where the moment of realization of being an apostate, you're like, wait, hold on, hold, shut the door. You know, being an apostate means you, you should be killed and then you go to, to hell, right? So I had that like in, in my last months in, in Yemen, but I also had it growing up when I realized I was gay. It was like, wait, is, is the exact same reaction. The only difference is I was like 10 or 11 when I had the one about being gay and I was much younger. I had no guidance. I couldn't talk to anybody about it, at least with uh, w with realizing and fathoming that God is much bigger than Islam. I could talk to my cousins and my friends and we would debate and argue all the time, but there's a conversation. But 10 years ago, before that, when I found out, wait, I am gay and I should be killed and then sent to hell, I had no one to talk to. I only had myself to speak to. So that, that's the main difference between leaving um, that dogmatic belief of you're going to be killed. And I think atheists and, and gay people in the Middle East and in, in the Islamic world go through the same kind of trauma of realizing you're something that should be eliminated from your society. And then phase two is silence and being completely shut down and not talking about it and, and remaining silent about it. That's why when I first moved to Sweden, I got on Facebook and I started like arguing and debating with everybody I could find in Arabic about it because I was, I had this mission, which is, I, this is in 2014, 15, I was still young and, you know, like in my early twenties, my main mission in life back then was I will do all my best to have as many Muslims as possible leave Islam. I believe that the less people believe in Islam, the happier societies we're going to live in. And I, I have my own way of looking at that right now. I don't believe, I don't do that anymore. I don't argue with people about religion or Islam or God's existence. Those topics used to be very interesting to me. Like whenever I'd meet someone like a Muslim or a God believer, I'd like start talking about religion. God, how can you believe in God? How can you believe in Islam? I think that I needed that phase of, of religious trauma to go over. And the old, when I got older, like I stopped caring whatsoever. The only thing I care about is just my rights, my human rights as a human being in Sweden. Don't kill me for being gay. And don't, don't try to push for Sharia in a country like Sweden. So my, my, my interests and ways of debating and creating content and what I post online have changed drastically in the past 10 years. And I would say I, I have matured because 10 years ago, I used to just debate and argue and fight with people about Islam and God. So I, this, these are my opinions. These are their opinions. We just clashed. But now I do more work that is less about who you are and what religion you are and what are your beliefs, but rather make more of holistic content about what my beliefs and what, what I think the way forward for the Middle East is. Because right now in 2024, I do believe the main de-radicalizers of uh, political Islam is the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Ten years ago, that would have never crossed my mind. Ten years ago, I used to put Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the same list as Yemen and so so Somalia and Iran as kind of like these terrorist states that kill gay people and women and minorities. Now, Saudi Arabia and the UAE still have laws that kill gay people and, and minorities and etc. Difference is they're heading towards the right direction. They're heading towards modernity. It takes time, but they're heading there. When I look at where Yemen, the Islamic Republic of Iran are heading, they're heading towards demise. They're heading towards even more repression and oppression. 
So I, I believe in the strong voices of the Middle East, the reformist Muslims, the secular Muslims, the people who live in the Middle East and want to curb the Islamic radicalization that has been downing upon us since the 1970s. Um, I was just going to interject because I think you saw my face. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't personally believe that Saudi Arabia is actually, maybe yes, you're right, heading towards part of more modernization, but you know, a lot of what has been happening in the background is that female activists are still being arrested. You know, arrest warrants in silence in the background are still happening. And a lot of the crimes are still happening, but they're covered up with the tourist part of it, the attractive part of, you know, what makes Saudi Saudi. I mean, I think also it it, it is quite hard that, you know, to, to make these radical changes, especially when you compare it to Iran, where, you know, you have a theocratic state that will kill you for not wearing the hijab and very publicly out there and is still not condemned by a lot of countries. I think Canada was quite recently the first Western government in the recent years that actually called the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran a terrorist state or like a terrorist group. And a lot of other com- countries haven't done that. They haven't expelled that. Um, but yeah, and 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 I was just I just wanted to go back to like you know when you said healing from religious trauma by you know the angry atheist face and then going to a position of you know identifying what your values are and then you know spreading those values and creating that common denomination of like you know you can still be a Muslim. But can we all agree that gay people shouldn't be killed or, you know, you can still be a Muslim, but can we agree that, you know, women deserve equal rights or, you know, bringing these stories to light? And how do you do do you feel like right now at this stage when you've you're, you're healing or have healed from that anger phase? Do you still feel like, you know, previously you were silenced or critiques or getting hate? for being that angry atheist? Do you feel like with your content now, even if you are trying to spread, share stories, that you're still getting that hate, but in a different kind of way from different people or even from people from the West? Like what, what are the two differences now? You've changed your content. You've changed your strategy. You've changed your mindset. I've grown up, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but what are you receiving in return for that change? So right now, as we speak, um, one of the videos that I did and uh, w- the one where I, I arrive in Israel and start meeting people and talking to them on the streets, that video is now, like as we speak, going super viral on Yemeni Twitter and Yemeni WhatsApp and all my family members are sending them uh, the, the video and telling me, what the hell is this? What's going on? And and even an Arabic channel has done a reportage on this, Yem- like a major Arabic channel has done a reportage on this Yemeni guy who's wearing Yemeni clothes and walking around in Israel and whitewashing Israel. So I think that the main difference that has happened now is th- before, like when I used to write my stuff in Arabic is I used to do it to provoke like I mainly my I was so angry at my society that I wanted to like punch back. So that was like I would punch back and then they would punch me right back and say that I have to get killed. Right now I don't punch, I inform. I just say it as a matter of fact and not not that not that what I was doing back there wasn't like saying things as a matter of fact, but back then I wanted to kind of like release out my frustration and anger towards my society while now it's more like i'm not trying to fight against my i'm trying to fight against my society's regressiveness but more so than that i'm trying to educate my society and the people who are watching watching about the terrors of islamic extremism and i think in that like before i used to be like uh, in 2014 was with islam now, 10 years later, I think like do, saying things like that does us a disservice. Sorry. Sorry, can you go back to before in 2014 and then you broke down a little? Right, I'm just going to bring my charger. I think my my computer is lagging because uh, it's on low battery. I'm going to get the charger. No, no worries. 
um but while the why is gone if you're all watching him and you haven't followed him which i doubt you haven't um please go follow him and check out his content um he would love to meet and talk to interesting people about their stories whether you're muslim jew or irreligious um i think loai from the person i know is very open-minded and wants to hear like different stories but also he's working for builders of the middle east right now so that's already a really good organization trying to bring informative content out there me doing their promo oh my god please tell me that please tell them to pay me <laughs> i'm still waiting for my massage checks um but yeah no um uh, please check out Mid builders of the middle east um i think there is um i think from what luai has done so far growing that page the reaction but also you know having chats with luai you know about about the current israel hamas uh conflict war genocide whatever people are labeling it um i feel like luai has done tremendous work in like actually changing his his mind or you know changing other people's mind or like just having a conversation and being able to disagree Um so please check out Builders of the Middle East as well. Um and if there are interesting people who you think, you know, might be good to have on that on their page, um let them know, message them. They're always looking to kind of bring those stories to life. You know, the Middle Eastern people that we, you know, in the West, like I talk like I'm a western woman, I'm not. Um but the the Middle Eastern women not women, the Middle Eastern people who have a dis- different perspective are almost you know silence because the loudest voices are the extremist voices and this channel is creating to kind of you know counter that so if you know somebody or yourself who should be on their channel for a story please let them know they're always looking for interesting stories so i know i go go back to your post uh, pre 2014 reactions to your reactions right now you know being a you know being being a provocateur and now putting informative content or quite literally just landing in Israel and talking to people has created the the negativity like the the news spreading like wildfire it's right. like your talk of the town and you know in many ways i can relate that with my community being so tight knit talk of the town um right. but no tell, tell tell us more about like you know what are the differences now So exactly remember when you were the talk of the town in Tanzania and everybody was talking about you being jailed and all of that shenanigans it's, it's pretty still much happening. It's still yeah, happening. It's, it's, like, it's I don't even happening. have to be arrested I have to exist. <laughs> exactly just exist and you'll have all the naysayers talking. But uh, so so right now um So what I'm happy about for example right now is when they made the TRT did a video in Arabic about our page and about my work the caption was saying oh who is this Yemeni guy in Israel making content and what is his affiliation to the Israeli government so that's the caption the video itself in the reportage it was like three minutes and a half they talked about like the content and like how I was anti-semitic before and then after meeting Jewish people in Israel i realized that Jews are not evil and then october 7th happened and i realized wow they really are trying to kill the Jews just like they did during the holocaust so this is actually batshit crazy so throughout all that like the the, the video the, in arabic they could not find a single sentence that i said in my videos that was provocative or hateful or trying to whitewash israel you know i'm literally just saying guys i'm in israel right now and i'm talking to israelis let's talk to them so is there an apart like i'm literally interviewing and talking to people so they were not able to 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 find an opinion and fixate on it you know they they just call me like an israel a friend of israel and stuff so i'm i'm trying to be a bit more nuanced in my criticism of my culture because i realized like maturing in the past 6 7 years has been realizing that you could be angry and you could say all you want about islamic extremism and your society but at the end of the day i want my society and i want to be to do better to become more secular open minded and liberal and i want the islamic extremism to vanish and the way to do that is by t- bringing muslims on your side because there are 2 billion muslims in the world the, you it's so much easier to try to alienate those 2 billion people and tell them that your religion is just stupid and you're condemned to hell 
in on earth because you're following the wrong devilish religion. I feel like that tends to radicalize Muslims even more. While the approach that I've, 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 I've become more keen on is, guys, I even if I identi- identify as a potato or as a Christian or as a Jew, everywhere I go in the world, when I tell them my name is Loy Ahmed and I'm from Yemen, they see me as a Muslim. And this has been my experience with so many things. Like I've been interviewed by people, even recently, um, and in 2019, in 2016, 2017, even though, like I say, I am an ex-Muslim, I don't believe in the Quran and the Hadiths anymore, they would tell me, so as a Muslim, how do you feel about that? Da, 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 da? And that made me realize that like the culture of Islam has become so dominant and has like taken over the Arabic language and the Middle East that there is no way around it. Like you and I, no matter what, we will always be Muslims to the outside world. And from my perspective, then, okay, I'm talking as a Muslim, as someone who comes from the society, like you would also notice that I have videos where I say, dear Muslims, we need to blah, 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 because I will always be a part of the Muslim collective as someone who's, who grew up a part of it, as someone who is seen as a part of it, and as someone who will always be described as a Muslim because of my upbringing, upbringing and my name. So I think the most interesting part or the most interesting thing about the reactions is seeing the reactions of the Muslims themselves in the West. So I, I'm mostly shocked at the fact that there are so many more Islamic radicals in the West that I could have ever imagined. People who would write to me the most terrorist lines, they would write things like, how come this man hasn't been killed yet and then i click on their account and i see that it's a yemeni who lives in new york city or a iraqi, you know, or iraqi who lives in berlin or a syrian like who lives in sweden and i'm just like well, um, yeah i like the way you said iraqi because you were like the arab in you came out iraqi and i'm like okay. <laughs> Um, no, it is you know you know there's this clip going around and there's this uh, of this UAE prime minister or foreign minister saying that the West will have more terrorists and radicalists than we will in the Middle East, and a lot of people like to reference it, but the reality is that it is the West. You know, it is a West that created this. And when I say created this, I do not mean like quite literally people saying that Bush funded the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. I mean, the West allowed this to happen because in the West, we see Islam as a minority religion. We see Muslims as, you know, minorities versus actually taking people's actions at face value. And we are the sellouts because we talk about wanting to preserve their society or not even preserve their society but preserve progressive values Mm. i also have a discontentment with a lot of swedish people who um talk about swedish values coming from christianity um and i and, and 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 i argue personally which is like is it christianity that was that brought this very unique values or is it, you know, our human evolution, progressive values that, you know, we tend to see cost and benefit of humankind? Or is, it, because or is of- it Christianity or is it fighting against Christianity that has led to the development and the liberalization of the West? And then when people say, oh, Christian majority countries or Christian values, and I'm like, look, secularism, the reason why countries are secular and the reason why you know, secularism in the West is a threat A threat is because we've seen countries like Bangladesh, where it is a secular country. And, you know, religion dominates, religion dominates, people are killed, like there's no, there, there are specific laws, there are exclusionists. And then you have countries like France that implement laicite, which is like a harsher version of secularism, mm. which is no hijabs on the beach, no burkinis. And now, you know, you have this two worlds fighting, which is a reaction to what could possibly happen in Europe, because a lot of people silenced people like us. A lot of people, you know, protected, they, they protected the Islam, uh, Iran's fatwa against Salman Rushdie, instead of actually saying, this is uncalled for and we should talk about it. 
Mm. No, yeah, this is, we should, we should, sorry, they, go on. You're right. And they didn't just silence the voices who spoke about the dangers that come as a part of this. They, they character murdered them. They called them racist. They called them Nazis. They called them far right. Right. When I, when I started writing articles and being in more engaged in 2018, I had the shield of being brown and being gay. So the amount of people that were able to call me racist or homophobic was very tiny, but even they looked stupid because you can't call a gay person who f literally fled the death penalty to, to Sweden oh, <laughs> homophobic. And you can't call me racist when all my activism in Sweden is fighting against racism because... My undying belief is that racism is rising in Sweden and other parts because of the unregulated and um, not studied well migration. Like people are be are turning their backs against people of color and Muslims and refugees because of the migration policies that have created divided societies. So now, and who will be the first ones to be kicked out? You and I as well. You and I as well, who will be characterized as the same. Because, yep. you know, the left, you know, wants to silence us in that way, you know, the right, the, the far right will win. The far right will win. They, they, they will get the power. We've seen this in the Netherlands. The UK had a different turn. But um, we're seeing this, you know, globally impact a lot of us, you know. Not, but what I have actually noticed is in, in the last maybe year and a half or so, Nobody gives a shit about the term Islamophobia anymore. It was a really yep. big thing five years ago. And now they're like, oh, Islam oh I, don't, I don't give a shit. You can call me that. Right. Right. I don't know if you've noticed the same. Yeah, yeah, of course. I've, I've noticed it. And I, I think um, what I'm fearful now towards is the pendulum swinging way too hard towards the other direction. So the PVV, which is the, the Dutch far right, I would actually say that they are far right, unlike the Swedish Democrats. The Swedish Democrats have far right roots. There's a big difference between having far right roots and being far right. Now, the Dutch far right, who have around 17% of the, of the vote, they want to ban Islam. Ban Islam. How the hell do you ban Islam? That's one. How are you going to ban a book? That's two. Third of all, it's like that kind of like irrational anti-Muslim hatred is going to um, result in even more Islamic radicalization because Absolutely. The, the terrorist sleeping cells are waiting for the for the for these kind of policies that prove that the Europe hates Muslims and hates Islam. As soon as they get that fuel, they're on fire. And this is something that they don't understand. I think the Swedish Democrats, which is the Swedish far right, have been more nuanced in tackling Islam. So you have Yimi Okason, who's the leader, who goes out and says, we have nothing against Islam. We have nothing against Muslims. We, we're against Islamic extremism. And then you have his right hand, uh, Rikard Yomsov, who goes out and says, well, actually, Islam is pretty much identical to Nazism. So you have like the, the like, but the main head who is Yimi Okason, he's more balanced. And he even talks about how there are Muslim voters that vote for the Swedish Democrats. So I'm happy that Sweden is at least more balanced than other countries in Europe when it comes to the far right. Because our far right are cute compared to how batshit crazy the other far rights in, in like, so if someone says in the Swedish Democrats, which is the Swedish far right, if they say we want to ban Islam, they would get kicked out of the party. While the, the, the head of, of the far right political party in the Netherlands straight out says we need to ban Islam and their votes are getting higher. I don't think that the Swedish, that the European far right are aware of how their inflammatory rhetoric is going to backfire and end up with more Islamic radicalization. They need to understand how they're going to be able to study and de-radicalize the Islamic communities in the West, which is something that the UAE and Saudi Arabia are doing, but the West is not doing. This, this West has this ever ending, never ending idea of freedom and liberation where even the Islamists and the Salafis and the Wahhabis get to be 
Salafis and Wahhabis because we believe in freedom, which is just the, the dumbest thing. But it's also like, but it's, but the one thing about Sweden is also, um, there were like 10 new rules that came into place in July. And one of them was actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, was enforcing deportation of people who should be deported or to find them because previously and, and there is a list um, of people who shouldn't be in Sweden who are categorized as extremists or terrorists and are still around Sweden um, or people who have been rejected asylum and then go to France and then or come to Sweden or go to France and stab somebody and they're like oh Sweden granted them asylum and that person was not you know France rejected them, and you said yes. And but but there but but I, but I see. But, but I think my my distaste with like the Swedish Democrats is it's just set a bad precedence to where we the world is going. Not just Swedish Democrats, like in Europe in general. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to be blamed on the left, right? Because they they attach themselves from liberal values, and they started forming this alliance with the far right, like. It's so hypocritical, but that is exactly what they're doing. The left is telling people like you and me to shut up because we're being racist and that you shouldn't even be in our country as well. Like you you get that, the cancel culture. And then the right is also telling the same thing, that get the fuck out of our country. Like, you know, they're, they're, they're literally doing the same thing. Um, right. But I want to move this conversation kind of a little back as well. You know, I love I love your political opinions, and we're gonna have, and we're gonna talk about it, and you're gonna be invited. I love, and I, lo I love the, the the last thing you said, where like the far left are like shut the hell up, and the far right are like get the hell out of here. So, so it's like there's no. And you're just you just the same to me. To me, you're like you're, you're both calling me names, which is like, you know, the the right will go like ground slut, and then the left will go like, um, you know, you're. Same thing, actually. Actually, same thing. They'll call me the same thing. They're like, oh, you're a cello. Right. You're going with the right. And I'm like... And the far left is going to call you far right if you are against the, the current migration policies. And the far left are going to call you far... And, and the far right are going to call you far left if you are for um, trans rights or if you are for the legalization of marijuana or if you are for the EU or for, so it's like both have their own narratives that you need to stick by and they're both irrational. They're so tribalistic. They're so tribalistic in their views, but, but I do find, and this is what I hate saying as well, is that what we've seen in America and in a lot of other regions as well is not the far right, but the right is becoming, or the left is now more center. The left, mm. the liberals, the classic liberals, the, the ethics or the values that le led me to leave Islam has become more center as well. And, you know, a lot of the right is becoming a little more tolerant, not the far right. The, the right is becoming a little more tolerant to be the child, where, while the left becomes slowly intolerant. And it has to do a lot with, like, you know, the cancel culture or being ostracized from having differing opinions, not being able to disagree because the right used to be, or like, you know, the right used to be heavily condensed with conservatism. And now a lot of people identify with the right leaning, whereas before they were left, because they want to oppose the left, because what the left has become. And that leaves, I think, you and me to be kind of like this um, orphans in between, where we're like, I don't know where I lean on this, because categorically, I, I think for me, categorically, it feels wrong to support Swedish Democrats or right-wing parties just out of their history but also then at the same time we're like you know we're left in this confusion limbo as well right. um but I and wanted to kind of sorry it, no yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly and I would also say that for me I don't vote I never did ever mm. since I became a Swedish citizen and um, I do municipality voting, so I vote for mm -hmm. municipality, but I even vote for political parties that I believe in that are not in the government or th that are not in the political sphere, like balanced parties that, that like I, I want to give a voice. But I don't vote for like the main political parties because I don't trust them. I don't believe in them. I don't I don't like what they're doing. I never did. What I like, if there's any political party that I would give a compliment to. It would be the Swedish Democrats being able to 
bring forth the, the migration as an issue to the table. Um, but now that they have done that, I don't see that they fill any other role. Like now everybody in Sweden is talking about migration and what migration has done to Sweden. Now we need solutions. And I don't think the Swedish Democrats have the best solutions. They do have solutions with crime, but I don't think they have solutions that are humane when it comes to LGBTQ and women refugees that still need a home. Because I do believe in a small quota of people that Sweden could still save. And I I don't believe that the Swedish Democrats are going to be able to successfully curate something. They were successful at bringing about the conversation. I'm not sure about them being able to bring up about the solutions. I think the solution is should come from the whole political um, like there should be political consensus from the whole fr fr from the parliament rather than just from one political party. So I don't vote, and I usually do tell people not to vote either because, yeah, I don't believe in the, yeah. in the political system as it is today in the Swedish one. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of betrayal for like I'm not a Swedish citizen, but even like it's a lot of betrayal for me to even just come to Sweden, pay my taxes, work my back off you know, to help others. And then I'm like, okay, but what is happening in Sweden? Or like, you know, where are my taxes going? Um, but I wanted to kind of bring back the conversation to more about you. Okay. So if it's okay with you and not to indulge, like, you know, not, not too kind of um, hard for you to talk about, I want to kind of talk about your parents. Sure. Right. Your your dad was assassinated. Yes. You know, for your mum is an activist, and then you had left Islam. Right. Um, a lot of this is those are difficult topics for one person to actually have to go through and live through, and um, you know, in, it's it's hard to think about how that has contributed to who you are today, but sometimes. You know, you've you've tried to keep a positive mind to it. You had a recent video talking about that distinct moment when your dad came home and fell on the ground. All right. Um, what was what was it like growing up with parents who were politically active? And you know, if you remember anything, you know, being as a child, maybe in school, what people told you about your parents or what you would have heard about even growing up, looking back when you look at your mom's work and, you know, a lot of people have admiration for her work, but what was it like for you being a part of that family, like your parents being politically active as a young child? So, uh, like I said in that video, when it comes to my father, um, the only memory that I ever have of him is when he died literally in front of me and my family. So besides that, I don't know anything about my father besides his work. But ever since then, and even until now, um, I would always have people telling me, your father was a hero. Your father was going to be the president of Yemen. He's the greatest writer and all of that. So I grew up with this image of my father being a hero, not like the Houthis. Uh, same thing with my mother and uh, my mom, after my father was assassinated, she kind of like shifted up her gears and became more activist. She started her own NGO called Sisters Arab Forum for Human Rights, started becoming even more vocal uh, about women's rights in Yemen. And my mom is pretty famous. I would say the majority of Yemenis know who she is. And when I was in school, I would always be, whenever my mom would come visit, nobody would talk about my mom being Amal Basha. But m when my mom would come and visit, she would stand like literally in front of the uh, the classroom to see me like in class. Um, and all of the students would look outside and see my mom. And when my mom is gone and it would be like lunch break, everybody would circle around me and ask me, why is she not wearing the hijab? Aren't you Muslim? Don't you know that you're going that she's going to go to hell? Don't you know that she your your whole family will go to hell if you don't cover your mom? And that was like a, a uh, something that occurred every year in in school where where the students would question my mom's Islam if she's Muslim and if she's going to go to hell. 
But beyond that, like just the classroom, like when I became a teenager, I, I started seeing the more of a physical threat towards my family and my mom. When uh, my mom would be subject to um, physical threats and physical attacks that I wouldn't know about because she wouldn't tell me, but then I would read about on the news or one of my family members would start talking about it and I'll be like, wait, when did that happen? How did that happen? So my mom did a great job at hiding all of the threats and all of the crap going on around our family outside of us. So my mom, my grandma would get phone calls all the time from people saying, we're going to kill your grandchildren. So me and my brothers and all of that was always hidden away from, from us until I grew up and I, you know, became like 14, 15. And then I started like reading news, being more active on social media. And that's when my mom couldn't hide anything. And my mom, my family actually has a dark um, history in Yemen in terms of it's not just my father getting assassinated. That was dark. Like my mom has been subject to a lot of um, uh, assassination attempts where they cut the brakes of her car and her car ended up crashing, but nothing happened to her. Someone threw acid on her face, but she hit it with, with her back. So she wasn't attacked. She, she, her face, the acid did not touch her face. My oldest brother was kidnapped for a few days and we had to have a presidential intervention in order to bring him out of the tribe that kidnapped him. And my second oldest brother was run over by a bus and he couldn't walk for three years and a half. He still has issues walking because of the attack. When my mom and I were driving one day in the revolution in 2012, she was sitting by the passenger seat and I was driving and there were thugs that were right next to the checkpoint and there, everybody in Yemen, especially the thugs have weapons. They looked at the car and they realized that my mom was sitting like right next to me. And, you know, the conservatives and Salafis and terrorists hate my mother. So they started shooting at the car and I had no choice but to like immediately shift gear and like drive as fast as I could. And we ran away. It was like a movie. It was a literal movie scene. Um, and I was like 16. Imagine me, Sara, like just... In the car with my mom, we see the thugs running towards us with the weapons. My mom screams at me, deuce, which is like, run. And I had to run. And we, we, so yes, a lot of trauma, a lot of threats, a lot of like violence, a lot of, and even like one week after that, where we were shot at by thugs, we still went to prisons the next week, me and my mom. So it was never off. It's like, yes, we might get killed, but you know what? 50% of the children in this country are getting married off before 15 and eight girls are dying every single week in Yemen because of early child marriage. So even if we get killed, if anything happens to us, it, it doesn't come... It doesn't surmount to the amount of oppression and, and, and violence that happens in the country. So we have to dedicate our lives into helping the helpless people. That's kind of like the mentality that my mom put in my mind growing up. And so like right now I was talking to my team and they didn't want me to go to the West Bank. They're like, it's too, da too dangerous. And I'm like, guys, I don't care what you're talking about. I know it's risky, but we are going to the West Bank. I don't care. What like who I have to talk to, we are going to go to the West Bank and I know there's a risk and I'm going to take that risk because all my life has been like surrounded by danger and that danger fuels our work and our voices. So I don't care about threats and like I get death threats all the time. I know that there's a high level of threat against me as a person because I criticize Islamism. I criticize migration. I'm very provocative. I support Israel and the Israeli people. So of course there's a lot of threats, but like I could care less. Like I could literally walk out of the apartment right now and get shot and I wouldn't care because I lived my life not silent. I actually said what I felt and I actually fought for my right to exist in Yemen. Yeah, that's long was, story short. <laughs> no, I was no no that was that was a really good summary and also very like hard for many people who live quite normal lives um to kind of like take in and just think about you know like it's it must be so hard like you know having that being able to compartmentalize and then still do what you're doing and then now you have this uh you know suicide goal of going to the west bank i mean i have been to the west bank but that was when i was a nobody i 
I loved it there, like in terms of like, it was just very eye opening. But my trip to Israel was for tech work. So it was very different. And a lot of people did say, hey, New York did get hurt. And I was fine. And I think my saving grace was like, one, I wasn't political, nobody knew me. But two, I wasn't Israeli. So or, or I wasn't a Jew. And that, that was like my saving grace, right? Because um, if anything did happen, I was like a tourist, like going there and hashtag free Palestine kind of thing. <laughs> and I did go there and I did go there, like being very anti-Israeli, pro-Palestinian. And this is in some of our podcasts in the Blasphemy podcast. Um, but I do feel that, you know, when we first, I don't know about you, but but like even your mom or maybe just your existence because your mom was politically activist. The moment we first spoke out in public, the risk existed. And that's the world we live in. The risk exists. No matter where we are, the risk exists. You know, Salman Rushdie was very recently attacked two years ago in New York after in hiding for 30 years. The risk exists. Obviously, we're taking multiple precautions to be safe, um, getting protected identities, etc. But the risk has existed for us. And that's the sad reality in that we live in right now. Um, but as we go towards the end of it and in the closing, um, I feel like I know the answer to this question because I know you. But I'm going to ask you anywhere, instead of an ending message that a lot of people ask, like, what is your final message to the world? I want to ask you two questions. At the present, at present, who is your current role model? And it could be one person, it could be multiple people, it could be a combination of people together. And what would you tell your younger self in Yemen? The younger self who was in that car that day, who was driving away. I would, um, so my, my role model is, uh, without any doubt, my mother, uh, even though we disagree very much so about Israel and Palestine. You are, you are her son. I feel like that's her genes in you. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I'll, I think I'll, like, I'll send her, I'll send her the end of this clip. I'll let her know. <laughs> Please do. No, just watching, like growing up and watching my mom get so much hate. She had like 300,000 followers on Facebook like 15 years ago. And everything, anything that she uploaded, she could upload a selfie. She could upload just like, oh, it's a lovely we uh, weather. And she would get hundreds of messages calling her uh, an old witch, um, an Iranian puppet, uh, a terrorist. Um, destroyer of islam uh, hell bound like that's all i read from my mom and my mom would look at these comments and laugh so she she's my muse she i like i took that with me so like now all the comments all the hate that i get i laugh at them just like my mother did because she fought for something greater um so my mom is my muse i wouldn't say that i have any muses in like the political i would say like my favorite debater like someone inspires me to become as eloquent and debate as eloquently and just be straight to the point and just witty and smart and eloquent would be christopher hitchens no doubt like no one comes close to him and and i love his books he's he's one of my heroes but i wouldn't say it's so hard like if he had he been alive today i would have told you christopher hitchens you know I can only imagine the things that he would have to say today. What what would Christopher Hitchens' co political and social social commentary be today? That would be ah, uh, I can't even I can't even fathom what he would say. So that's one Christopher Hitchens, but he's dead. May he may he rest in peace, and power. may he rest in power. And as for what would I tell young me? Oh my God! You know what I would tell young me? Don't worry. In the future, you're going to be able to say everything on your mind. Because all my life growing up in Yemen, one of the, like, the, some of the first thoughts that would be in my head is, I have all of this crap that I want to say, but I can't say it. 
I have so much that I want to, uh, to get off my chest, but I can't do it because the Yemenis would slaughter me. So I didn't know back then that I would end up in Europe. So I wish I could go back to that Luai and be like, calm down. It's going to be all right. It gets better. Eventually, you will have your own microphone and you'll be able to say whatever the hell that goes on your mind. And yeah, you will be able to 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 engage openly about your opinions and what you believe and think. So I think like growing up, I was always sad thinking that I'm never going to be ever be able to actually voice out what I'm thinking and my inner feelings. I always felt like, oh shit, you have all of these thoughts, but you will never be able to say them to anybody. You're just going to be in the closet. Um, so yeah, that, that is something that I would tell my younger self is that don't worry, you will, you will be able to, you'll have a microphone one day where you can, you know, create all the stuff you want to create. That's and amazing. Do you want to talk about? Yes. It's amazing. I feel like you're empowering yourself as you're talking to, as you're talking to your younger self in this podcast, you're like, this happened and this is where I am. Um, but Definitely. thank you so much for being on the podcast. As always, it's lovely talking to you online and even lovelier offline. So thank you for having me, my co-podcaster, my co-host. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're we're gonna we're gonna invite you again to like do some of the blasphemy podcasts that we had planned. Uh, I think we need to re-record some of it. Yes, um, it's like the Taylor Swift's version of Taylor's version. <laughs> the bl blasphemy. Do you like? That's that's how you, you get me in line. Yeah, the bla blasphemy that's... version. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly the blasphemy we might have version. To re we record every single episode. <laughs> oh, but I think I, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, this was great. I I hope I hope these were this podcast was a bit different than the other ones. It was. You definitely asked. I mean, I know you, Sada, so I was kind of prepared before this because you always, like, even if we're just having dinner, you're always going to ask the deepest, most interesting questions. So you did actually ask me at least five or six questions that I've never gotten before. So I had high oh. expectations and you met them. Nice. I, well, I'm really, I'm really, really glad. I'm going to stop this recording for everybody who doesn't yet know Luai, but like I said, that is rare. Please follow him. Uh, and Builders of the Middle East, where he works. Um, again, you know, uh, it is an organization that is bringing stories alive. And if you want to support a lot of the stories from the Middle East, instead of listening to Cynthia Nixon, an actress who doesn't actually know about the Middle East, maybe listen to people who have lived there and know about the context of it. But thank you so much, Luan, and thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.